to Chase Berry for three. Rebound by Peyton Crispin. He's going to put it back. And oh, he's got it. The Lakers get a three. So welcome back again. He's a bird on the Lakers. Can't get the shot to go. And the Lakers win the ball game. Go! Do you like to work with metal, fire, electricity? Would you like to make money doing it? At Southwestern, we can help make your dream a reality. With our degree and certificate programs in welding, you'll be prepared for a career in the welding and fabrication industry in as little as a year. Check out our website and let Southwestern spark your career in welding today. I'm Private First Class Taylor Irwin and I'm with the Maryland Army National Guard. I joined the Army National Guard to begin my career. So I have been awarded tuition assistance and I picked furthering my education. Right now we're just going through the basics. We're doing the confidence course. It's to get over your fears basically and to see how far your team has come. It takes a strong leader and strong drill sergeants as well. You're gonna meet some really cool people and they're gonna help you get through it either way. So it's gonna be really fun. This is Southwestern's dental assisting program. In just one short year, you could be a dental assistant. Sign up now for your one-year dental assisting certification. Hi, my name is Ron Metzger and I've been teaching geology at Southwestern Oregon Community Don't College for the last down. 20 years. It's an exciting time to be teaching in the health and science fields at SWAC as we work towards funding a new health and science facility at the college. Kalito Hall is the building I work in and it houses our science labs. It was constructed in 1965 and so the labs have undergone relatively little updating since that time. Over the years, we faculty have provided an exceptional foundation in the lab sciences. It's relatively easy to see how an investment in the health side of the facility will pay dividends in our local communities. The added lab and class space will allow additional cohorts of nursing students and new programs. This will allow our local residents to go through the programs and earn family wage jobs at Bay Area Hospital and all of our other local health care providers. As we look forward, it'll be interesting to see what we accomplish as a college and community with lab facilities and equipment equal to the task of teaching in the 21st century. 
I hope you will work with me as we move forward with this project. So thankfully, we just signed the contract for the new building. So like any day now, giant me gets to go away and we don't have to use it. Hopefully, I will be really, really, really happy about that. Uh, some of you are young enough that if you choose to go here in a few years, uh, you can take classes in that nice new building. If you decide to take uh, upper level science classes, uh, we just got a scholarship with a five in it, $500,000 that's gonna end up uh, being utilized for upper division science classes and engineering. So that's one of the options in a few years. Those of you that are taking classes now, I'm sorry it's not available yet, but so it goes. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce to you this afternoon, first and foremost, thank you for coming up from Bandon and uh, North Bend and Marshfield as well, as well as some of our SWAC students and also some folks out on live stream uh, to hear Shannon Cobes Nowotniak, and I dropped the V, sorry. Uh, Shannon's here in Coos Bay, basically out of a strange set of occurrences. My wife and I were di driving up the five to go see Dave Matthews in the Gorge last year. And close to Portland, we heard Science Friday on NPR out of Portland. And both Shannon as well as her co-PI Darlene were really intriguing and painted a great picture with sound. And so I thought, wow, if you can do that good at making me visualize all these things going on, with sound, what could you do with actual visuals? And so that led to her being here. And she also was willing to show up early and talk to some students about STEM careers and uh, some of the things at Idaho State where she teaches. So without further ado, Shannon. Thank you so much. So thank you guys for being here. This is a fantastic opening. I feel super fancy now. Hopefully I actually have a visual soon. Otherwise you guys are gonna get a lot more of that word painting. Um, so, I am an associate professor at Idaho State University and the director of the University Honors Program there. And I've been really, really privileged to be very involved with a lot of NASA research lately. So I want to show you guys some of that and I want to convince you why you should go into geosciences and why you should transfer to ISU from here. Perfect. So I call it walking the moon and beyond in Idaho uh, because it turns out Idaho is a really, really fabulous, it's actually the world's best analog locations for planetary science. Who would have thought? The average person in the US doesn't know where Idaho is and really doesn't know that we have anything there other than potatoes. They've got us switched with like Iowa plus potatoes. It's, you know, it's a thing. But it turns out we are one of the world's best places for doing analog research. So this picture on the left there is an air photo of the Eastern Snake River Plain. We've got all of these volcanoes. Yellowstone, hotspot, ripped through here, destroyed what we actually had before, and has now left us with over a mile thick of lavas that are pretty much the same composition as what we have on the moon and Mars. Uh, that are sort of our big planetary analog. They have the same forms, all of this stuff. It's really cool. And so we go out with our very serious groups of scientists, including NASA researchers, active astronauts, and students, uh, to be able to study this. So clearly we're a very uptight bunch, as you can tell from that, that photo. Oh, come on, slides. There we go. So convincing you, things look about the same. So this is a picture of Inferno Chasm, which is a, a feature on the Snake River Plain. So you've got a scale bar there. You can sort of see it's got kind of like that tadpole shape going to it. On the right-hand side, it's got that head. It's got that squiggly tail. Well, it turns out that's almost identical to features on the moon. It's just a difference in scale. So you'll note that on the upper right, I've actually got Inferno Chasm. Let me see if I can point there. That's if I drew that on there. It's just a whole lot smaller because it turns out gravity makes a huge difference. Gravity having the atmosphere for cooling things down. So this scale bit issue becomes really interesting and in how do we translate between these things and how do we start to use places like Idaho, Hawaii, and Iceland to be able to understand these other planets. 
Most critically, what we'll be talking about tomorrow in the search for life, extraterrestrial life in our solar system. Uh, here's actually a comparison between Inferno Chasm, not Inferno Chasm, King's Bowl lava field in Idaho and Sienna Fosse on Mars. Both of them, we've got these cracks in the Earth where we've got magma rising up, an extensional system. It comes out, and in the Idaho case, it finishes pouring out onto the ground before it ends up interacting with the groundwater to create blasts. So if you've ever heard, heard when you're putting out a mat that sound, as you're cooling it off real quick, it's like that only with dynamite. The lava, as it actually interacts with groundwater, will actually start exploding. It's going to turn that water into steam, that same sort of sound, only now it's going to be large enough that it's going to be shooting rocks out of the ground at 50 to 100 meters per second. And so we're using this area in Idaho, King's Bowl, and actually measuring all of these rocks on the ground there to figure out how fast was it, how much water was possibly involved, so that, that way we can calculate for these other pits on the right-hand side here at Sienna Fosse, what sort of volume of groundwater or ground ice did that magma have to hit to be able to create these pits? As we actually still see those blocks on there, now we can start to figure out what are the resources that are there now and what are the ones that were there in the past? Life needs water, as we understand it. So it's really important to start figuring out what are our budgets, what do we actually have? Now, as a geologist, I get to travel all over. And since I'm trying to convince some of you to be geologists, I want to show you some, you know, some reasons why. So if you like hiking, if you like camping, if you like fishing, if you like setting things on fire, if you like traveling to other places, this is your major. This is what you want to go into and study. So this is actually a little grainy, but that's a night shot looking at the Kilauea Lava Lake in Hawaii on a class trip with students. We went there and we spent a week hiking around the volcano, uh, looking at these different lava features and measuring them. Um, we're actually doing work, as I was saying before, like with NASA. This is actually the first version that they had of these simulated astronaut backpacks they want us to be walking around in. If any, if any, raise your hand if you've ever gone backpacking, like even just like day hiking with a pack. All right, good number of you. This is an outdoorsy group. Every last one of you should be looking at that backpack and feeling super judgy. I mean, look at that. Doesn't that look terrible? I mean, think about the comfort fit. Look at the distance between my back and where that metal frame starts. Now think about the fact that they wanted me to wear this while being a fake astronaut in an area that had gusting winds up to 40 miles an hour. I'm lucky I didn't fly away. So we end up having to pull all of this knowledge. We actually had to fight with NASA about this design. Their answer was, well, it, it worked in the Desert Rats program. And my answer was, I can find you any student from you know, Idaho or the broader Pacific Northwest that can tell you you're an idiot. Because none of us are going to wear that. This isn't, this isn't healthy, this isn't safe. So in the end, they had to fly a NASA engineer from Kennedy Space Center to Idaho so we could make him hike around on a lava field so that way within 10 minutes he could look at me and say, we can't use that backpack. So there's all of this, this learning that you're already bringing with you that can actually be applied to this sort of stuff. Um, this map is actually just... I like to tell people the sort of places I've gotten to go. So every single star is somewhere where I've chased volcanoes or that I've gotten to work while chasing volcanoes. You'll note that there's probably not a whole lot of volcanoes on the east coast of the United States. But in the subsea project, which I'm going to be showing you guys a couple videos from, we were, had mission control set up there in Rhode Island to be able to remotely operate submarines over in Hawaii that were collecting rocks off of underwater volcanoes a mile deep. So I've gotten to go all of these different places. So again, if, if you like to travel, if you've got that adventure bug, uh, this is me in front of a volcano erupting in Japan. Uh, this particular one um, erupts sometimes two, three times a day. And it becomes a huge mess for ash in this area. But it also was bringing nutrients to soil. So some things that we have to do as a geoscientist are not just worry about, hey, this is really cool, it's blowing up, but how is it affecting the community? What are the positives? What are the negatives? And how do we actually interact with the people who are here? So you actually also need to start paying attention to culture and aspects with that. Um, we're also just the dirt people. Or if any of you guys watch uh, Big Bang Theory, you'll also know of us as the Kardashians of science or the rock lickers. 
It is a thing. We are proud. Um, we use a variety of tools in our trade. So everything from going out with the two-handed sledgehammer to pulling up the supercomputers. We actually, over at ISU, have full access to the Idaho National Lab supercomputing system. So we just tap into that and we're able to model things and actually understand these larger systems, analyze all of this data that we're bringing back from the field. Our department even has its own system. We use like high resolution data. Other tools, a little less common. This is Hercules, the submarine that we're using to study the seafloor in the Pacific. So this is it being launched off of the deck of the exploration vessel Nautilus. We would launch at midnight, and it would take us about uh, four hours to get to the seafloor, just dropping straight down. You can see the people there for scale. These things are fairly large size, is being towed on a tether by the research vessel. And it actually has another uh, submarine that goes along with it that's entire job is to just hold the cables, to give the Hercules enough space to be able to move around to navigate and do what we're asking it to do, which is use its robotic arm to do things like this. That's actually a crowbar that its robotic arm is holding onto, and it's prying pieces of rock out of this volcano a mile deep. So you can see a little bit from, I can't tell like how clear the image is from your guys' side. From my angle, it's a little blurry, but you see sort of that brownish color? That's actually pyrite. That's an iron sulfide that's precipitating out, mediated by these microbes that are down there, uh, that are basically pooping it out is they're interacting with this hot water coming up through the rocks and the actual surface water uh, there in the ocean. And it's creating these veins of it. So we're actually popping that out using this super high-tech crowbar uh, being wielded by this very, very advanced robot that we're controlling from the surface. Uh, we're looking at where volcanic eruption columns go. One of our projects right now is trying to look at, on Mars, where could the ash have gone from a volcanic eruption column, and could that actually be changing the hydration in the soil system, or the regolith that's up there, that could make areas more or less habitable to microbes that actually survive off of those things to eat. All of those bubbles in the volcanic plume, and the, the pumice that comes out, those are made by water vapor. So how does that change the nutrient balance that we have going on up there. Uh, we also just love to play. So this, these are some pictures from class trips that we've taken just in the last few years to the Grand Canyon. This is our field station in central Idaho. Uh, we we'll offer a five-week capstone field class every summer. The idea that you could go camping and hiking and actually we eat really good food. Oh, and that one, uh, working on the edge of um, uh, Mauna Ulu in Hawaii. We're trying to understand how the water rock interactions there. We still have a very hot system. We've got hot water coming out of the ground, interacting with the rock, is creating areas we have microbes actually living. They're concentrating them up. And we have evidence from uh, the rovers that are up there right now on Mars of having passed hydrothermal activity like that home base area on Mars is a really good location for indicating some of that. What are we actually looking for when we're there? Because it's not enough to say, okay, the water's got the stuff that's living. We need to actually get closer to it to figure out, okay, is the water concentrating life or is it also concentrating the toxic chemicals that are being brought up from that volcanic system that are killing life? So we are creating these complex halo systems. So when we go up with a manned mission to Mars, which is you know, the plan, 
You guys are the right age to actually be part of that. Which rock do we pick up? We can't pick up all of them. If we only get a certain amount of mass, how do we pick up the right rock? And how do we bring that back to Earth? And so that's why we're motivated to do all of this sort of work down here. Now, my bias, of course, is towards volcanoes and towards space exploration, frankly, because I think they're just fantastically cool. But geoscientists work in a whole range of things. So a lot of them go into oil and gas or mining or environmental services, uh, water rights and protection, cleanup, making sure that we actually have the resources that we need to be able to keep going forward. Even better, they get paid. So I love it when I'm actually recruiting students in my own program that I get to tell them it's not just a cool degree, it's not just that you get to go camping a lot as an undergrad, it's that you graduate and you're actually making solid money on the outside. So uh, median pay in 2012 was around $90,000 per year. As for all geoscientists, we find, and this is consistent with what we've got up at our school, and I'm sure it's probably consistent with what Ron's got down here too, bachelor's degree, seeking, bachelor's degree students in geosciences come out of school with an average starting salary of around forty-five dollars to $50,000 per year. If you do a master's degree, which is two more years, and it should normally be free in our field, so you're not having to pay more student loans and the rest of that, suddenly your starting salary option jumps up to eighty dollars to $90,000 straight out of school. We've got students that are coming out of our programs that are signing contracts for six-figure jobs that are being held for them. One of the students in my working group has already signed a contract with NASA. She starts down at Johnson Space Center the day after she defends her thesis. It's not bad. So we've got a lot of really cool things going on, and I'm really concerned why this is actually jumping slides on me. Um, so why, why ISU? You got a real cool program right here. But I want you to consider us also for next, after that. A lot of people don't realize that leaving your in-state range doesn't necessarily have to mean taking on the dreaded out-of-state tuition. There's actually a Western Students Exchange. It's called it was WUE, uh, pronounced WUE, because we couldn't come up with a better acronym, unfortunately. But that means that a student coming from Oregon, going to Idaho State, still pays the same amount that they would pay at Oregon State if they were in-state tuition. Um, we have a department that is entirely focused on traditional field work coupled with cutting edge technology. So it doesn't matter if you are a comp full on computer geek all the way through the person who wants to hike off into the woods and come back two weeks later with a bag full of rocks and a giant furry beard, whether you're a man or a woman. We all work on our beard growing. This one's been going for years, by the way. Yeah, it's not coming in very well. Um, you know, we, we have that full range of opportunities out there. We've got internships. We've been sending students on internships to NASA, to mines, to oil and gas, to environmental groups. We actually work directly with the Department of Environmental Quality, uh, as well as tribal organizations that are right there in Idaho to create these opportunities. We want our students doing this stuff while they're there. Our students also have opportunities for career path internships. So somebody who's transferring from somewhere like here would be considered extremely competitive for a $5,000 internship immediately upon transfer into ISU to actually do work in their field of study and get paid for it while they're there. We also are outdoor rec people. So the picture there for the downhill skiing, that's about 13 miles off campus. We've got a world-class Nordic Center. If you're a hiker, a mountain biker, all of that, we've got it right there in town. Um, some basalt cliffs right in town that's totally free climbing for students, including all of your rentals. All of this stuff, and it's actually really cheap because Idaho hasn't figured out money yet. You know, I mean, we're not really gonna accept potatoes in exchange for things. We're, we're a step above that but not by a lot. So it's a really affordable way to have an incredible education and get to have a lot of fun while you're doing it to then prepare yourself for a field that's growing faster than the rest of the US economy, that has jobs, and that actually pays reasonable money for those jobs. Uh, to give you opportunities to travel all the world, to be engaged with all of these different topics and problems in these complex situations. Uh, using all sorts of crazy tools. So I want to invite you guys to get involved. 
I want you guys to be the next generation who's actually pushing this, who's getting us that new footprint, not on the moon, but on Mars, that is working out how do we actually get there, which rocks are we picking up, how do we actually keep people safe on Earth, what do we have to do to make sure that we've got safe drinking water, that climate change is, is combated, that when we're mining resources, we're not just dumping stuff into the ground, we need to, we're not at a non-mining state, so how do we actually do this in a way that protects the rest of the environment and the rest of our communities? So I want you guys to be part of that and helping us to create all of this. And you can do that at the bachelor's, master's, or your PhD levels, depending on how far you want to go with it and what you want to be able to specialize in. I mean, you, you could even be like Ron and be chasing dinosaurs. I know that's not your actual thing, but it's, it's paleo. And you know, those are just your real big ones. So I want to make sure we've got time for, for some questions, discussion. Talk to me about what sort of stuff you guys are interested in. And if you want to hear like, all the stuff with the submarines and the astronauts type thing, I want you to come back tomorrow for the formal talk. So what do you guys got? Talk to me. <laughs> so, there we go. The microphone's actually kind of quasi-important because if anybody's out there listening on live stream, if they don't have the sound, they don't have the sound, and then it seems kind of wonky. Anybody got a question? Seeing so many, I'll break the ice. Uh, so, if I was like a whole lot younger than I am now, and I was either in high school or I was just starting at a community Hi, college. My name is Ron Musker, what would be and I've the been most teaching geology at Southwestern Oregon Community College for the last I should 20 be years. Thinking about it's an exciting right time now. to be teaching in the health and science field. You know, it's always a good place to start with your general education. I mean, you're going to have a general education requirements wherever you are, and doing them somewhere like here, you're going to be able to transfer them to your other schools, wherever then you go beyond. But get in that intro geology class. Like, Take that as your, your science requirement. Get in there and actually start playing with these rocks. Start to actually see what they are. How do you interpret them? How do you actually read rocks like a crime scene to be able to pull together the history and the future of an area? Uh, plus, field trips. I mean, geology gives you field trips. And I have, if, if you don't love field trips, it means you're doing something wrong with your life. What could go wrong if we throw the mic? I mean, come on. Then I'd never get it back from him. <laughs> how did you come to geology? Like, how did you make the decision to make this a field that you would dedicate your life to? So I was a rock nerd from a very early age. Um, I got a free ticket to the Tulip City Gem and Mineral Club show when I was in kindergarten, and I liked things that sparkled. And this was a chance to basically play with professional grade glitter and convince people to give me shiny objects. Oh, I, I wish I could tell you that like when I was little, like I was something better than that or that I had some like crazy epiphany. No, I really liked shiny objects as a child and I liked things that sparkled. And somebody gave me a rock that had trace amounts of gold in it so I knew that I was cooler than anyone else. Um, I convinced my parents to get me a hard hat and a rock hammer when I was still in elementary school and take me to mines where I could basically roll in mud. It wasn't bad. Uh, so it's a fantastic field for getting into like that. But the truth is, is that most geologists have no idea that they're going to be a geologist until they take their general education science class in college because schools don't really teach geology most of the time. Very few schools offer actual geology classes. Most schools in the US don't give you anything like that at all. And so most students don't find that that's their path until they get a class with somebody like Ron who shows them what they could be doing and what you could be going out and playing with and that there are actually jobs in this. Um, so that's actually a really common way to get in. I didn't know I wanted to do volcanoes until I had a teacher like that in my undergrad who admittedly offered me money to make photocopies. I got a suntan from that photocopier. Um, and because apparently I was trustworthy making all of these photocopies, he helped me get an undergraduate research grant. And because he studied volcanoes, suddenly I was studying volcanoes 
And even as a geology major, somehow it had never occurred to me that that was a thing. But I fell in love with it. I mean, the, fa the fact that I'm allowed to study things that are mountains that blow up on their own is phenomenal. Um, you know, and so it's just sort of kept growing as I get more into it, but there's a lot of places for, where people join in, and if you hadn't thought about geology before, that's totally fine. But we are secretly your major. You just haven't found us yet. One thing that I, I'll point out, I'm a space cadet and, and, and a physicist by, by trade, so I look at things in terms of looking at the geophysics side of things, but projects like this look like very interesting ways for physics students to also get involved in terms of transfers, so would there, would there be mechanisms for, for that to happen as well? Absolutely, so in our last deployment uh, with NASA to Hawaii, we actually opened it up with the Idaho Space Grant Consortium. They paid for two students from any field of study in the state of Idaho at the undergraduate level or above to come join us in the field. We, previous to that, had had a high school student who'd embedded with us for two deployments and actually came out and worked with us. Um, we didn't actually get anybody from physics specifically, but we had an, a mechanical engineering student who came out. All of the students who have interned with us have received offers of internships for NASA, to go work for NASA for the summer. And all students who are graduating from an I Idaho university, the Idaho Space Grant Consortium will actually pay for that internship to be able to make it so that, that way more students get hired. Um, so and that, that's not just for geosciences, that's for physics, it's for math, it's for biology, uh, for all of these different things. You know, trying to create a better pipeline when we think that it's really important is we do these massive projects to get our students involved, to pull them out and actually engage them. We didn't get to have more people come out with us in Hawaii because it turns out Hawaii is expensive. And we were there in November, which does get in the way of classes just a little bit. But we still had students out there who were paying for their entire trip. The students didn't have to pay anything, and they were actually working on these teams as full members. Other questions? I became a paleontologist because I picked up fossils when I was about this tall. How many of you have taken a high school earth science class? Okay. I did, Mr. Zolads, he had a glass eye. He used to set it on the table to keep you from cheating. <laughs> and I will tell you, we all believed him too. Eighth grade. Other questions? That is actually a true story. He probably has passed by now, but other questions? Wow, it's one of the quietest groups I've ever seen. What's the coolest thing that you've ever done as a trained professional geologist? Serving as a simulation astronaut for NASA in Hawaii, wearing the giant backpack, not the one you guys saw, an actual clean version, partnered with Dr. Stanley Love, who is an active astronaut for NASA. Close second, being paid to ride a horse up a volcano through the rainforest while wearing a machete. I mean, it, I mean, machetes are cool. Rainforest, volcanoes, all of it, pretty darn fantastic. No, I love that I get to go on these crazy adventures and I do things for my job that other people go, they have to save up time and money to do on vacation. Question? Was there a oh. hand right there? Um, how, much geolo how much does geology have to do with chemistry? So we do have some chemistry. Now, geologists out there who are dialing in are going to actually weep a little bit when I confess this, but I have not taken a proper chemistry class since I took AP chemistry in high school. Um, so different kinds of geologists will use more than others. But depending on the kind of geologist that you want to be, just having your sort of basic Chem 1, Chem 2 can be appropriate. If you want specifically to be a geochemist, there'll be a little bit more. <laughs> uh, but we can use chemistry for a whole bunch of different things. Like I'm actually using the chemistry in these rocks to be able to understand what the microbes are eating and what they're leaving behind. So we can actually look for that as sort of trace evidence later and figure out which rocks are going to be the most habitable for these little bugs that effectively live inside the rock. 
Uh, we're also looking at the chemical exchange. We've got specifically geochemists modeling how that interaction works, uh, figuring out what the stable areas are depending on the temperature and pressure and pH of the fluids going by. We've got, we've got a wide swath, but don't let chemistry be what stops you. Because I'm interpreting your question as being anxiety about chemistry, not that you love chemistry. No, I'm going to, I just got accepted into a chemical engineering oh. program, actually. I love chemistry. All right, well, in that case, <laughs> geochemistry. We need those people. We definitely do. Ge Geology is great because it's a nexus science. It uses chemistry, it uses biology, it uses physics. So if you kind of like science in general, but you're not certain where you are in that spectrum, again, you're actually a geologist. We're the ones who actually take all those things and actually use it and do things. Change rivers. Thank you. How much math do I have to take? Ooh, math. <laughs> So, so math, like chemistry, math. it really depends what you're actually trying to be able to, to focus on and do. So in my particular field, it turns out volcanoes are made of math. Because like, there's only so much you can do to like, get inside of a volcano without the whole like, death thing. Mm -hmm. That's just not great. And so if you're going to actually understand a volcano, you actually, actually have to do some more math. But there's other parts of it. So I actually went through partial differential equations. But there's also like, all kinds of geologists who are doing like just their first calculus class, maybe they were using statistics more, things like that. So there's a variety of, of levels that you can go depending on what you want to actually focus on. Uh, I was wondering if you've ever gotten to use explosives to collect rock samples. <laughs> Ron, you said this is being recorded. There's witnesses. Uh, so I... I I have not personally gotten to actually blow the things up. Um, my undergrad, there was actually a class called drilling and blasting where you could be on a team and blow things up in a mine. Um, I always had a course conflict. It was actually one of the things I regret about my undergrad was that I did not get to take that class. But I have gotten to do a lot of um, Rock hammer swinging, I have thrown rocks in frustration. I mean, I've gotten to use a crowbar to pry them out of the ocean floor, which if I can't actually set off the explosive myself, is not a bad follow-up. Out of all of the volcanoes you visited, which one is your favorite? Oh, that's hard. That's like picking a favorite child, right? <laughs> <laughs> you know that you're the favorite? You're, oh, clearly, yes. Um, you know, I think... I think my favorite's probably Kilauea in Hawaii. It's got this beautiful open lava lake where you can actually go at night and you can, you can hear it sing. You can watch the spray coming off of the lava in the pit, depending on how tall the lava lake is, and you can actually hear it. Uh, and it, it actually gives a sort of like humming sort of sound that we describe as being uh, Pele singing to us at night, which is just phenomenal. Uh, Pele is the Hawaiian uh, volcano goddess. But there's so many others to, to love as well that it's real hard to let go of the other ones. I think my, my favorite volcano names are definitely Ayafiatla Yokel, uh, that's that vicious Icelandic one, Popocatépetl in Mexico, and Kick them Jenny, literally three words, kick them Jenny. That one's underwater, no idea why it got its name, but I love it. Uh, so when I was uh, you know, plugging the talk tomorrow night and recruiting people for today, I got a lot of questions about the, you know, was showing the poster and the link between underwater exploration, robotics, volcanism, and, uh, and extraterrestrial life and I, I could have explained the link to them, but I, I thought I would leave it to, for, for you to do that. So um, in the, in the you know, chance that, that some of us might not be there tomorrow, could you talk a little bit about the link there and the research that you're doing? Yeah, so I was starting to hint about this a little bit before with the Mars thing. Where we've got the, the femorals where it's concentrating hot water, but that could also be areas that then dry up, or could, like the home base area. That's not wet anymore. Or that it can be concentrating toxic elements as well as the water that's actually keeping things alive. So if we want to get a bigger view, we actually go underwater. Now, obviously, heading to the ocean floor is not going to be telling me about Mars. 
but it is going to be a really good fit for Enceladus. Enceladus is Saturn's sixth largest moon. Uh, Cassini flew by it and gave us some spectacular images. Turns out, so we, we knew it was a, there was a moon out there, this is a little dot, but as we got closer, we realized the entire outside is covered in ice. There's a liquid water ocean underneath that ice and then a rocky interior. The south pole of Enceladus has giant geysers that shoot out and have actually created the E-ring for Saturn. And when Cassini went through, it was able to, with its uh, spectrometers, determine that it's salt water with simple organic molecules in there and silicon nanoparticles that suggest that we actually have warm water rock interaction that's going on in the seafloor, just like we have at isolated submarine volcanoes like we have at Luihi off the coast of Hawaii. Most of the research that has been done in the past in the deep ocean in volcanism is concentrated on the mid-ocean ridges. We've got these big spreading centers, you've got the black smokers, you've got all these like weird, crazy colonies of things. But the temperature is there is so hot, it's actually not a very good fit for places like Enceladus. Also, Earth is basically the only place we've found that we have documented plate tectonics. So if we're going to try and study some other planet, going to one of these plate tectonics places is kind of a poor choice. So the temperature and pressure conditions at Loihi are almost spot on for what they should be based off of physics on the seafloor of Enceladus. So we're trying to use that area there to understand these water rock interactions, what the actual microbes are that are living in the rock that are being swept out by these warm fluid vents, um, and what they're actually doing to the rock in the process. We have, uh, it's only maybe 10, 15 years ago that we started to realize that all of the rock on the sea floor, so it's all, it has glassy rims on it because it cools so quickly in contact with seawater, there's microbes that eat that glass. We hadn't realized that before. And so it's this huge uh, biome that we didn't even realize existed until maybe 15 years ago. So now we're still trying to understand what that is. What is the habitable space? What are they actually surviving on? What are they using? How do they actually survive? How are they infiltrating these areas? Up to 300 meters below the sea floor. I don't mean 300 meters deep underwater, but below the rocky sea floor. If these are areas that are not getting that solar energy coming directly to them, they're getting these weird extremophile cases, what does that mean for what we could have in somewhere even more crazy like Enceladus? So we're trying to understand Enceladus by using this area. And it, it could be that Enceladus is perfect for life, but nothing lives there. Just because something is a really great house doesn't mean somebody lives in it. So we want to first understand what are the conditions that would make it a good house, could things actually be there, and then from there, as we're continuing to work out, how would we actually test for critters there to make sure that we don't introduce anything by accident and contaminate Enceladus itself. Let me throw out one quick extension with that. You mentioned, the, you mentioned Enceladus, but would this have applications to things like Europa with the NASA Europa Clipper coming? Absolutely. Europa is, Enceladus and Europa are basically like joined together as being these top locations in the search for life in the solar system because they've got this liquid water situation protected underneath these like fully encompassing um, ice surfaces. Uh, both of them are being targeted for additional exploration. There's also a lot of people working on designing robots that are going to be capable of, say, landing, drilling their way through ice, and then being able to crawl around underneath the ice to collect information and then find their way back out. So there's testing of those sorts of robots that's going on um, in like Arctic and Antarctic sea ice environments right now to be able to figure out, okay, well, if we could get something there, could we even just do something, or are we just now standing on top of an ice ball? Uh, so the stuff that we're doing is, is equally valid for Europa. Just Enceladus has those giant four cracks in the South Pole that make access a little easier. Since Trent mentioned that many of our band and folks, if you are interested in more of that and can't make it up to Coos Bay, uh, it will be live streamed as well. So you do have the capacity either tomorrow night or in the future to, to um, tune into that. Any other questions? Hearing none. Thank you all for showing up today. Thank you, Shannon, for putting us early on your schedule so that we could make this happen. And enjoy the weekend. Hopefully, we'll see some of you tomorrow night as well. And I'll be lurking up here if you guys have a question that you just didn't want to ask in front of everyone. Thank you.